Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here at the James Porter Colloquium. Um, I'd like to thank the, um, the committee for inviting me um, and allowing me to share a little bit of my research today. Um, my presentation is titled James Van Der Zee, Marcus Garvey, and Photography's Relationship to the New Negro. Um, in the summer of 1924, during a busy period in his career, James Van Der Zee became the official photographer for the Pan-African leader Marcus Garvey and his organization. One of the many photographs produced by Van Der Zee during this 1924 moment is an image of Garvey seated in an open-top car as part of the Universal Negro Improvement Association Harlem Parade Procession. In the photograph, Garvey sits amongst his entourage. While resting his hand on a staff, he also appears to raise his gloved hand and points, a gesture that summons an imaginary horizon past the well-dressed individuals standing near the car and those who sit engrossed in the scene from their upper level, upper, upper level windowsill. Unbeknownst to either Van Der Zee or Garvey at the time, photography would play a crucial role in advancing Garvey's objectives. Understanding the complexity of the medium's overlook role in his international movement leads to questions about Van Der Zee and photography's role in Harlem during the New Negro era of the early 20th century. For example, why were a significant number of Van Der Zee's local images of Harlem seen by audiences throughout the diaspora? Noteworthy examples include this photograph of a parade float, this next photograph of Garvey seated in Liberty Hall, and this third photograph of UNIA members. More broadly, I would like to ask, how might thinking of these images as a conduit between Harlem and the larger African diaspora expand current understandings of the importance of James Van Der Zee's photography and photography more generally during the New Negro era? The allusion to an unpictured place suggested by the Pan-African leader's gaze in this photograph is compelling, given how viewers of the early 20th century would have seen this image. They would have experienced Van Der Zee's image through print media, and more specifically, through the UNIA's newspaper, The Negro World. For example, in a series of Van Der Zee photographs arranged on a single page of a 1924 Negro World newspaper, the photograph called Marcus Garvey in a UNIA parade appears crowning the top column of the page. Like a previous Negro world spread of images by Van Der Zee from days before, this page features 15 photographs, many of which include the photographer's etched signature. The layout is, central, the, the layout is a central column of three framed by angled images under the heading photographic views of Great Convention Parade. The Van Der Zee photographs are arranged in such a way that they suggest a dynamic movement outward from the center image to the edge of the page. This gesture of outreach dovetails with the Negro world's objective to embrace a readership located in Harlem and throughout the larger African diaspora as part of the UNIA strategy. In 1919, at the very infancy of the Negro World's print run, Garvey declared that, quote, if there is to be a united sentiment among all the people, if there is to be unity of action in everything, then there must be a medium through which the sentiment must be created. And the greatest medium for creating sentiment in the world today is that of the newspaper, end quote. The importance of the newspaper for Garvey and the UNAA reflects the larger centrality of print media during this era for black audiences. Described in 1926 as, quote, the greatest single power in the Negro race, end quote, the black press had a distribution and readership that reached unprecedented levels during the years of World War I to the height of the Great Depression. The Negro world in particular was exceptional among black publications. It played a dominant role by becoming the first black paper with a circulation of over 200,000 within both domestic and international spheres during the early 1920s. For a black organization to achieve such exposure reflects the success of the UNIA's networks of distribution and its solid link 
to African diasporic audiences around the globe. The larger stakes of Van der Zee's photographs of Harlem appearing in this particular venue, I argue, offers a fruitful platform to illustrate photography's role as central to the New Negro movement by way of its global circulation and reproduction. Scholars have turned to a range of strategies to articulate the link between the New Negro era, photography, and James Van der Zee. They have done so by focusing on how the prideful representations of Van der Zee's sitters radically reorient the more prevalent depictions of African Americans during, during early 20th century toward the ideals of advancement and respect espoused by the leaders from the era. By drawing both from an analysis of print culture and photography, my approach privileges the circulation of Van der Zee's arrangements of photographs through print media and the circulation of numerous printed photographs more generally as a major force within the diaspora of the early 20th century New Negro era. For me, the significance of this approach comes into view through the very forms and varied circumstances through which photographs, both materially and visually, circulate and inform different audiences. Looking at the African-American photographer James Van Der Zee and the Jamaican figure Garvey together bring into full relief how the international circulation of photography enabled people from all around the world to witness formative visual narratives of the New Negro era. Garvey often thought in pictures. This grand narrative he created and proselytized through his organization had a strong visual component. For example, he told stories of visiting UNIA members' homes and disappointedly noticing pictures of Jesus that were not the black men with woolly hair he preferred to see. He believed that indications of racial achievement would take the form of a black Napoleon, quote, whose picture we can hang in the Hall of Fame in Africa, end quote. On other occasions, he spoke directly to his UNIA audience about not only what they would see on the wall, but also how they would be the featured representations. In a 1920 address, he insisted to his members that, quote, in the years to come, your picture will be hanging in the gallery of Africa, and your children will be able to see what you did, end quote being seen by others in an ennobling light would become just as important as being visually represented. Along similar lines, we can turn to a 1922 Negro World article in which the black sculptor Augusta Savage is featured in a photograph with her bust of Garvey. A second larger and closely cropped photograph of the lifelike bust on its own reaffirms the importance of Garvey's re representation. In these examples, portraiture is employed to motivate and inspire his audiences. For him to have a representation of oneself viewed by others was to have arrived to a certain level of stature and importance in the world. These informative examples provide a motive behind Garvey's interest in photography. However, this preoccupation developed over time. I would like to introduce a particular eight by 10 inch full length portrait of Garvey featured in the Negro world. Attributed to Van Der Zee, this photograph was taken at Toussaint Studio at 451 Lenox Avenue in New York, the studio at which Van Der Zee worked with his sister in the very, very beginning of his career. I turn to this photograph because it illustrates how Van Der Zee's early photograph represents Garvey on two levels first visually in a singular eight by 10 inch photograph, and secondly, discursively, given how this one photograph is then arranged and reproduced among other photographs within a page of the Negro world. In the portrait, Garvey stands in the center of the photograph with his body slightly turned to the left and his gaze looking out to the distance. In his hand facing towards the viewer, he grasps a sword this long, shiny object complements his military-like uniform that catches the light at different points along his belt. His head is positioned as to advantageously show the elongated shape of his hat, which is topped with meticulously placed feathers. A sense of awe is enabled through his carefully arranged pose 
through the camera's position. In fact, the created perspe perspective is one in which the viewer slightly looks up to Garvey in reverence. The background, however, detracts from Garvey's regality. The space is restricted. The depth of view is shortened by Garvey's close position to the wall. On either side of him, the domestic items simultaneously frame and center him while overcrowding the space within the picture's borders. Their fragmented inclusion fails to suggest their con continuation into an expansive space. Instead, we can imagine that they are positioned within a cramped space. The backdrop attempts but fails to create the suggestion of extensive space. The checkered floor depicted within the backdrop pulls our eyes back to imply that the wall meets the floor near Garvey's upper leg, thereby creating a false sense of depth. Any reverence the backdrop may have implied is minimized by its artificial nature. It appears to be more of a poster hung on a wall than an image fully integrated into the portrait. Although parts of the photograph's composition seem counterproductive to elevating Garvey's stature, as a reproduction within the Negro World newspaper, this photograph appeared very differently. In a 1921 edition, the photograph was featured among 11 individual portra portraits of prominent UNIA members. Its upper central position at the top of the middle row is telling of Garvey's status and the full-length composition of his portrait is distinct in comparison to the predominantly closely cropped other portraits. Garvey reigns among these figures, many of whom are missing the uniform grandeur um, Garvey dons. Instead, they wear collared shirts, ties, and in the case of the only woman included, an outfit that lacks the iconic head wrap of the Black Cross nurse UNIA uniform. With the exception of Garvey and the portrait of His Highness Gabriel, um, Gabriel Johnson, there is nothing UNIA specific about these portraits, nor are their visual formats identical. Some photographs are rounded um, with varying depths, while others are square with a range of different backdrops. Although the backdrop of Garvey's individual portrait seems to detract from his sense of importance, Within the reduced newspaper reproduction that appears alongside other portraits, the background becomes less of an impediment. Instead, it contributes to Garvey's prominence by suggesting a grand domestic setting in comparison with the other portraits' unadorned backdrops. This early photograph, its arrangement and reproduction among other portraits that focus on individuals, functions discursively within a complex visual narrative created through the arrangement and reproduction of Van Der Zee's photographs for an international diasporic audience. As this short presentation has shown, a consideration of photography and how it operated through its circulation and reproduction during this new Negro moment enables new inquiries into how and why Van Der Zee's Harlem photographs became significant beyond Harlem and beyond his studio alone. No longer limited to Harlem's photographer, Van Der Zee shapes the visual culture of an international movement and thereby links Harlem to the greater African diaspora. Thank you.